This video is sponsored by Squarespace. The Mai Tai is the quintessential Hawaiian cocktail, but it turns out it's not actually Hawaiian. In fact, more often than not, when you order a Mai Tai, you're not getting the Mai Tai, at least not the original Mai Tai from 1944. So today we are making that original Mai Tai, or at least as close as we can get. We'll also tackle the controversial history of its creation, and I'll do so from Hawaii. The Mai Tai, this time on Drinking History. So I am here at the Kuleana Rum Works on the big island of Hawaii, not that far from where they actually distill the Kuleana Rum. They are carrying on a tradition of making rum here on the island that goes all the way back to King Kamehameha I. An early Hawaiian historian, Samuel Kamakau, said, The first taste that Kamehameha and his people had of rum was at Kailua in 1791, or perhaps a little earlier, brought in by Captain Maxwell. But while they may have had the main ingredient available, it took another 150 years for the Mai Tai to wash up on the shores. But when it did, it was the 1944 recipe from Trader Vic. Two ounces Ray and Nephew 17-year Jamaican rum, a half ounce orange curacao, a half ounce orgia syrup, a quarter ounce white sugar syrup, juice of one lime, shake well with plenty of crushed ice, pour unstrained into a double old fashioned glass. Sink your spent lime shell into drink, garnish with a mint sprig. And we can pretty much make this exact drink with one notable exception. You are not likely to find any Ray and Nephew 17-year-old Jamaican rum. There are a few bottles still left in the world, but usually they're sold at auction for about $50,000. So I'm, I'm not using that today. Now, Vic himself described the rum as surprisingly golden in color, medium bodied, but with the rich pungent flavor particular to the Jamaican blends. The flavor of this great rum wasn't meant to be overpowered with heavy additions of fruit juices and flavorings. And even Vic himself didn't use the rum for very long because just a few years into making his Mai Tais, he had gone through the world's supply of that rum. So he switched over to the 15 year, and by the mid 50s, he'd gone through all of that too. So then he switched to his own blend of aged Jamaican rum and rum agricole, which is a rum made from fresh sugar cane juice, typically made in Martinique or Guadeloupe. So while I wasn't able or willing to shell out $50,000 for a bottle of rum, most everything that I am using in this cocktail is available on Curiata. And I'll put a link in the description to where you can order that. So for my dark rum, I'm using this Appleton Estate 12 year. It's the oldest distillery in Jamaica and is now owned by Ray and Nephew. And for my rum agricole, I'm actually going to be using Kuleana's rum agricole because, you know, when in Hawaii. The other ingredients I'm using are Pierre Ferrand Dry Curacao, which is a bitter and sweet orange flavored liqueur, and the Lieber & Company Orgia Syrup. So Orgia is a sweet and a little bit bitter almond syrup that often has some botanicals, usually rose, or I think this has a little orange blossom. I'm actually going to try a little bit. It's like marzipan in liquid form. Absolutely delicious, and you really can't make the original Mai Tai without it. Then just some simple syrup and the juice of a lime, about one ounce worth. Then we give it a shake with crushed ice and pour the whole thing into a glass. Then garnish with a sprig of mint. He also says to put the lime shell in there, but unless you have a much bigger glass and a smaller lime, that's not really gonna work and that's okay. Here we go. It's very different from so many Mai Tais that you get. It's not nearly as sweet. It is sweet. I mean, it's still a, a tropical tiki drink, but you're really tasting the flavors of the rum and the orja. You're getting, it's so much more complex than when they just make it with a bunch of fruit juice and rum. And I definitely prefer it this way. It's basically like a Hawaiian vacation in a glass. But there are so many newer versions of this drink. It has a long and complicated history and I'm gonna give you a short history right now. The year is 1944. Victor Bergeron had been proprietor of a bar for 10 years in Oakland, California. Originally called Hinky Dinks, the bar had gone tiki recently and he changed the name to Trader Vic's. Now Vic had found some success with the bar, but things were getting a little stale. It was time for a new cocktail. So one night he went behind the bar and grabbed that bottle of Ray and Nephew 17-year-old Jamaican rum and made the first Mai Tai. 
I stuck in a branch of fresh mint and gave two of them to Ham and Carrie Guild, friends from Tahiti, who were there that night. Carrie took one sip and said, Mai tai roa ai. In Tahitian, this means, out of this world, the best. Well, that was that. I named the drink Mai Tai. But is this how it actually went down? Because Vic was kind of a spinner of tall tales. Often he would take a fork and stab it into his wooden leg and tell people that he had lost the leg to a shark, when in reality, he lost it to tuberculosis when he was six years old. But frankly, the Mai Tai story just doesn't seem that far-fetched, so I don't see why he would have made it up. But there is one man who claimed that it was made up, Don Beach the originator of the tiki bar. See, Don told people that Vic had based the Mai Tai off of a punch at the beachcomber. The QB cooler was the basis for a drink he took with him, and he called it the Mai Tai. And it is known that Vic was a big fan of the beachcomber and took a lot of inspiration from the place when he opened Trader Vic's. Though Fred Fung, Vic's assistant for 41 years, swore that while Vic may have taken a lot of ideas from the beachcomber, basically just taking the entire concept of the tiki bar along with a lot of other things, when it came to the Mai Tai, he did concoct that, and Kerry Guild did name it. And you kinda got aside with Vic on this because the QB cooler had 10 ingredients and the Mai Tai only had five, and of those ingredients, they only shared two, and it was lime juice and rum, and it wasn't even the same kind of rum. So I say Vic gets the credit for the Mai Tai, but it didn't really matter, at least for the first few years, because it wasn't that popular outside of his place in Oakland. But when Vic partnered with Matson Cruise Line in 1952, he put together a cocktail menu that featured the Mai Tai, except that it was actually way low on the list, below the zombie and planter's punch. But it was there on the menu, and it was made on their ships and at their hotels, including the Royal Hawaiian in Waikiki. And it was there that the Mai Tai really took off. And throughout the 1950s, other hotels in Hawaii decided to cash in on the drink's popularity and added the Mai Tai to their menus. Unfortunately, the recipe was a very well-kept secret, and so these other places were just making their version of the Mai Tai. And this is when you start to see orange juice and pineapple juice and grenadine being added, and the dark rum float on the top, which is very common still today. But whether it was the original or one of these knockoffs, the Mai Tai was a hit with tourists, and they took it back to the mainland when they went home. There they served it at the many Polynesian-themed parties that were all the rage in the 1950s and 60s. In 1962, the Deputy Secretary of Defense threw a luau in Washington, D.C., with guests as illustrious as ambassadors, White House staff, and even senators, including Robert Kennedy. And afterward, Washington society columnist Betty Beal wrote, Don't say black tie, say Mai Tai. And the Mai Tai subsequently became the most popular drink in the country for several years. And as its popularity grew, its association with Hawaii actually began to irk Vic because the drink had been made at his place in Oakland. And so he started to put up signs at Trader Vic's that said the home of the Mai Tai. And he cashed in on its popularity by bottling the drink to sell at stores. But he wasn't the only one. See, around 1970, another bottled Mai Tai began appearing on the shelves and it said that it was the original Mai Tai. Who would have the audacity? Well, of course, it was Don the Beachcomber. See, the rivalry between the two had been growing for years, and in many ways, Vic had won. Not necessarily because he was doing better, but because Don had not done so well with the business. He had had some money problems, some problems with several ex-wives, and so his first ex-wife now owned all of his restaurants. And I think that this bottled Mai Tai might have just been a way for him to get some of that dignity back. But Vic didn't really care, and he sued him and won. But in doing so, Vic had to put the original recipe for the Mai Tai in the public record, which is why we have it today, so I can make it here. And I'm sure glad, because it's absolutely delicious. This is, uh, this is still my first one, I swear. But it won't be my last. Now, I've already tasted this, and usually I do the tasting at the end of the episode, but I wanted to taste that earlier because I wanted to actually taste 
the rum agricole from Kuliana and this nanea, which I've actually already tasted and it's fantastic, but I want to taste them side by side. It's a bit more of an aged, uh, aged rum. So this is the agricole and it's 100% sugarcane juice grown here on uh, Hawaii, on their farm, and that is what we used in the cocktail. So I'm gonna try it solo. It's nice, it's very just kind of neutral. Those, there's a little bit of a, a fruitiness in there, like uh, maybe pineapple or, or something like that. It's, it's actually very, very nice. This is made partly with this. Um, and it's then aged in cognac barrels for 18 months and then blended with several other rums. So gonna be a little bit more complicated. Uh, kind of the goal here is to make it more like, a, like you would have a tasting whiskey that, that you taste. This is, this is going to be more in that vein. Let's give it a try. I love it. I just love it. It's so smooth. The burn is, it's almost an afterthought, an afterburn, if you will. Um, and so you're just getting the flavors. It's, it's really, really wonderful. And I think could go in, be used in cocktails, but doesn't need to be. It's, it really is just lovely for sipping. Maybe a little bit chilled, you know, cause, just cause it's hot in Hawaii. Um, fantastic. And they have lots of other rums, well, a couple other rums uh, that uh, are absolutely worth trying. So if you want to check out Kuleana, I will put a link to their website so you can see where you can buy them online or, or somewhere in your state. Thank you to Kuleana for, for hosting me here and for Hawaii for being just the best place to take a vacation and make wonderful cocktails. Wait, 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 don't go away yet because we are not quite finished. Since I filmed that video in Hawaii, I found this wonderful quote from Trader Vic himself. See, Vic was a teller of tall tales and he liked to build up his origin story. But in the 1960s, after he had made most of his money, he decided to kind of come clean on his famous origin story. He was being interviewed by Barnaby Conrad, who sounds like a fascinating character himself, because not only was Barnaby a celebrated author and artist, he was also a nightclub owner, boxer, and a bullfighter. Go figure. Anyway, he was interviewing Vic, and he asked him a little bit about the Tahiti part of his origin story, how long he had been in Tahiti, and Vic admitted, I went to Tahiti last year for the first time, and I hated the goddamn place. Here all these years I've been promoting South Seas cuisine and South Seas products and I go there and see it for myself and it rains all the time and the girls have bad teeth and the food is crummy and I can't wait to leave. It's the pits. It's a boil on the ass of creation that place, I'll tell ya. Quite the charmer. And essentially he was promoting a product he had never even tried before. So that makes me glad that I have gotten to try the service from today's sponsor, Squarespace. I am closer than ever to finally getting tastinghistory.com up and running thanks to Squarespace's powerful and user-friendly online platform. Your Squarespace website can help you create a community with a system that supports comments, replies, and likes. Then you can use audience insights and connect with that community via email communications and even generate revenue through gated members-only content. And if your business is product centric, like maybe you sell handmade sweaters for cats, then Squarespace has so many powerful extensions to help you manage inventory, promote products, streamline bookkeeping, and even ship those bespoke feline cardigans all across the globe. So go to squarespace.com to start your free trial. And when you are ready to launch, then go to squarespace.com slash tasting history to save 10% off of your first purchase of a website or domain. And I will see you next time on Drinking History.